Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. This beautiful, beautiful Black History Month. And Black History Month this year is the Black Family, Representation, Identity, and Diversity. And we have Dr. Douglas Rushoff, uh, who is an author, a teacher. He is a thinker, a writer. He does a whole lot. Good morning, Douglas. Hey, good morning. Welcome. I'm so glad you could take the time to be with us this day. I got interested in you when I read your article, How Centuries of Black Strength Created a Blueprint for Economic Recovery. And I'm really interested in economic recovery, particularly coming out of COVID. And so how did, how did you get to write something like this, given that you're not black? Well, <laughs> I've had a, a, a long, strange past. I mean, I was a, a theater director who got fed up with theater because it cost so much money. And I was doing a production of Three Penny Opera, and the cheapest seat was 40 bucks. And I said, the Internet came around, and I thought, here's going to be – this is late 80s, early 90s. Here's going to be an egalitarian people's medium for us to have you know, new peer-to-peer culture and economics and love and understanding and all. So I started – you know, it got involved in the Internet and writing about that. And that thing sold out faster than – Anything I've ever seen, it became this awful corporate extractive surveillance, you know, economy. It was just, it was awful. By, you know, five years in, it was gone, that original spirit. So I became interested in why did that happen? How have these people, these great creative digital minds, how have they come to accept corporate capitalism as like the underlying operating system of our whole world? You know, why couldn't they see there were so many other options available to them other than becoming the biggest, meanest, most horrible, you know, uh, NASDAQ stock exchange ticker symbol. So I got interested in economics and looking at where's the roots, where did this happen? You know, and I did all this research about, you know, the Renaissance and colonialism and when central currency got invented and corporations got invented. And, and I was way more interested in how do we retrieve the good, the comments, the co-op. So just real quickly, you went from theater director to an economist. Yeah. You went from managing plays in New York, and you wanted people to be able to come into the plays to see the plays. That's everybody, open for everybody. Yeah. And then they were just too expensive. And so now you're trying to figure out why is this so expensive, and it got you into economics. That's I got that so far, right? Yeah. Well, it got me into the Internet. But then the Internet okay. got expensive, too. The Internet became a business. The Internet, when it first came around, we thought of the Internet was going to retrieve cooperatism, that it was, it was you, you as me and me as you. We're all together. It was like the realization of the great hippie dream of one great big cooperating organism. We talked about it as virtual communities, that it was going to bring back community to a world that it turned into a consumerist mess. But then the Internet turned into a consumerist mess, too. So that's when I had to look at, econom at economics. Why does this keep coming back again and again and again? And what got me interested in, in this in particular was I started to speak at different conferences about my other ideas for how economics could work. How do we bring back cooperativism, something called distributism, where owners own the tools of production, subsidiarity, where no business has to grow just for the sake of growth. All the stuff you talk about on this show, you know, why cooperatives work, how circular economics work. We're not extracting money from people. We're sharing wealth building with people. And I start talking about that at these really elite conferences. And I remember I was at one. It was an Ivy League conference. And this woman, much smarter than me, I'm sure, she gets up and she says, oh, 
I love all of your ideas for cooperative economics and the commons, but tell me, aren't these things really the kinds of things that happen in wealthy, elite, progressive communities? How would inner city people ever understand the value of these approaches? I was like, inner city people? You mean black people? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> this stuff comes from black people. Go to Philadelphia and see the cooperatives that have been there for the last hundred years. Read about the Black Panthers. You were told that these guys were militants. They were cooperativists. This was the, the original thing. And I didn't have enough arguments to make because they kind of laughed at me for saying these things. So then I started doing deep scholarly research, and I found you know, someone who's a frequent guest with you, Jessica gordon Nemhard, who wrote yep. these books. You know, she went to the churches and the knitting societies, and she found the documents, the records, that black people have been doing cooperativism since they came here, since they were on the ships they were doing it. They were already sharing. So it was like I decided I wanted to write this article because I wanted to say it's not just black lives matter. Black ideas matter. It's like this black thing is not our problem. This black thing is our solution. They are holding the keys to how do we rebuild our economy, particularly in the post-COVID era, that we don't have to get a loan from a bank to get this thing kick-started. We can turn to one another. And I started mining her work and others for what are the examples and what are the methods? How do we as a nation now you know, retrieve these things rather than, than shun them? Buddy, you have said a lot. Uh, you have said in, in two minutes – what I have been talking about for seven and a half years on this program, mm. you got it succinct and clear, and I appreciate that, and I'm so glad you came on this program. Now, can we go back to your your history, though, your education? Yeah. Your t- tell us where you grew up and where you went to school, and how you how you end up going into managing a theater, managing plays. Uh, well, I mean, I was political, you know. You know I'm a, a, a New York Jew. Uh, we came to New York because my um, my family, we're from this place called Kishinev in Moldavia. It's like Russia kind of, you know, like Ukraine, Russia area. And the Jews were similar. Jews there were similar to blacks here. They, had, they were isolated. They weren't allowed to own land. They weren't allowed to participate in the economy. So they had these little towns called shtetls where they lived, and they could only trade amongst each other. But as black people here found, if you can only trade amongst each other, you end up getting circular economic activity. You end up recirculating and you get a living economy, an organismic little economy. So the, some of the little peasant Jews were starting to get that in these towns. And the other Russian citizens there got really jealous. You know, so they started raiding the towns. They came in and they hanged my great grandfather and they threw my grandfather in a well and raped my grandmother. And finally, my grandmother escapes with a little baby and gets to America and she becomes a labor activist. She starts marching with Eugene Debs. You know, it's an mm. interesting history. So I always looked at, you know, this sort of local local economics and mutual dependency and where does that come from? When I got into theater, I was directing Brecht and Clifford Odette, you know, political theater. It was always about how do we do a play that makes people leave the theater and do something, not leave the theater so satisfied that they've had this experience. But the more theater I did, the more I saw people coming and congratulating themselves that, oh, I cried for a black lesbian, you know, as if having sat through the play and felt empathy for the, the characters on stage means that they're good people, not motivated to go out and do something in the real world after the play. So for me, it's always been about how do we activate people to actually engage in, in you know, whether, whether it's mutual aid or basic civics, you know, basic empathy um, for each other. And that's been been really the journey. I thought theater would be the tool to do that. But then, you know, I kind of just went to the net because it looked like, well, that would be the tool to do it for the whole world. And it's really been my work. And now, you know, more recently, I you know, wrote a book called Team Human, which is looking at, you know, how do we use these tools to promote humanity rather than enslave humanity? And uh, I feel like we're, we're in danger of kind of programming ourselves, you know, off the cliff rather than uh, – you know, using these tools to retrieve the kinds of social and economic and political mechanisms that could lead to a much more, you know, uh, prosperous and harmonious existence for ourselves. So you're teaching somewhere. Where do you teach? And what do yeah, you teach? Yeah, I teach at a public university, um, CUNY, City University of New York at Queens College, which is, again, it's like, I mean, to be paid to do this is just over the top, right? 
because this is my social <laughs> justice work as well. You know, I'm teaching first generation Americans. Everybody's the first person in their family to go to college, you know, and boy, you know, I taught as an adjunct at NYU for a while to like some really rich kids. And I remember there was one day I was teaching a class and talking about this kind of stuff. And one of the kids got up and he said, well, why should we listen to you? You ended up a teacher. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. And I'll tell you, when I teach at a public university, it's the opposite. Every single student, bar none, they are so grateful to get to be in college. You know, they are, they, everyone who shows up, they're thankful to be there. They found someone to sit for their kid or someone to cover for them at the restaurant or someone to help their mom, you know, to, to take care of their mom while they are in class learning, you know, and, and, you know, bettering themselves, not just to climb up some corporate ladder, but to actually have the knowledge they need, you know, to remake society in their own image rather than, you know, someone else. I always said that whenever they ask me, what kind of job can I get after this? And I'm always like, you know, college is not about figuring out what job you can get. It's about figuring out what job you can create. You know, it, when they feel that empowered to remake the world, it just, boy, it's, you know, and to get paid for doing that is just crazy. Yeah. Okay, so you have already enticed me to get back in the classroom. I taught math at York College and part of CUNY in Jamaica, Queens, back in 70, oh, my God, 72, 73. God, they had math back then? <laughs> well, it came out of Egypt, okay, <laughs> this, uh, this math stuff, okay, out of Africa. Uh, so, um and then down, and then to San Diego State University. Then I went to Stanford, got my MBA, and then I went to I worked ten years at Cummings Engine Company, and then I taught five years at Howard, running their MBA program for a couple of years. Oh, wow. But I didn't get this. I got satisfaction out of watching the light turn on, whether it's math mm -hmm. or marketing, or but not the satisfaction that you just described. Uh. The satisfaction because I have it, have had it that education, particularly for Black folk, was where do you get a job. We're educating people right. to how do you get a job. Even in the MBA program, there was an entrepreneur class over here that I took, but it was not still getting you ready to own your own business and that whole mindset. So what you're talking about is like, yes, absolutely. I'd love to get into the class and teaching that kind of stuff and getting that kind of response. How it was my best students in that they really were there to learn like you're talking about. But San Diego had to fight with the weather and the and uh, and the sand and the beaches and all of that. So, uh, yeah, I yeah. like I like what, you, is, like what you're talking about. It's, it's reframing entrepreneurialism. You know, being an entrepreneur is not how well you dance for them. Being an entrepreneur is how entrepreneurial are you about the whole model of your business? You know what I mean? How entrepreneurial can you be about uh, figuring out how your workers can be co-owners in your business with you? You know, how entrepreneurial are you to figure out who are all of the stakeholders in this business, the town where it operates, the places where my garbage gets taken, the, the places where I, I, I get my resources? How can I include every one of those things in the same system? And then you're an entrepreneur. And we're going to take our first break, and we're going to come back to that, how you become a real entrepreneur. You you defined it in a much broader sense, and that's the cooperative world of people, right. planet, and then profit. People first, planet second, then profit. And we'll be back and talk more about not only get more into the history of this cooperation in the black community, but also we want to talk about what the future is going to look like after COVID. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative, and we're providing you information, information so that you can go out and start your own co-op or join a co-op, uh, start your own business, or as our guest is beginning to talk about, he has said he's gone from being a theater production to the Internet to economy, and now he teaches about entrepreneurship, which I call wholesome. I thought about this at, in the break. It's wholesome and that is good for the entrepreneur, good for the employees, good for all the stakeholders. And what I want to talk more about is you said that not only is it Black Lives Matter, Douglas Rushoff, you said mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, but Black Solutions Matter, Black Solutions. And I want to get into what are some of those solutions that you have found 
that blacks have created. And it's also very interesting to me that your family coming out of, I want to just say Russia, uh, yeah. and were created so badly that you under, you from a history standpoint, you didn't have to live it, but your, your grandparents and great-grandparents had to live through this, were treated as slaves were treated or blacks were treated in, in Jim Crow and, and all of that because of your, your religion. So you have in your DNA the same as I do, this, this trauma. Okay. And so you understand that. Uh, and, and, and I, and I get it. But what are these solutions, these black solutions that you talk about that perhaps can help black lives matter if we can create these solutions? Well, it's really it's a way of understanding all of the black solutions we already know about, or most of them we should, as examples of economic cooperativism. You know, the, the, from the very beginning, it's before the American Revolution, 1700s, 1600s in America, you know, blacks would, would informally, they would, like, raise money collectively to purchase one person's freedom. Then that person would get, it's sort of like chain migration in a way. That person would get out and then do everything he or she could to raise more money to get out the next one, then those two would get out the next one. What is that? It's the opposite of getting your freedom and then running as far and fast as you can and just being, you know, I made it, goodbye, but coming back and bringing another one. Um, the, the Underground Railroad is a cooperative. This was a form of, of collective knowledge and resource sharing. It was like a, a, what we in the Internet era would call a, a data commons. Right? We take all the data that we have, we put it on a Google Doc, right? and anyone can come and go, oh, I can find water over here. There's going to be a safe part of the woods over here. There's a friendly uh, a, a lock, a, a, a horseshoe maker, whatever, a blacksmith over here who lets us sleep in the, uh, in the barn. So it was, it was really that early you know, that it was going on. Then they would you know, wait, share wait, wait, before you be, Before you go yeah. further, I, I want to come back. I'm sorry, but I, I, want to, yeah. I want to emphasize one thing in this Underground Railroad, too. Jessica Gugur Nimhard brought this out in her book, Collective Courage, and she's been on this show and she's talked about it. But the Underground Railroad, as I understand it, was mostly white folk. White people had the, the barns and they had the, the, the wagons. And so we've had white people helping us out throughout this getting us out of slavery. Whites that abolitionists right. that did not want slavery, did not see anybody enslaved. And so they created, they took right. their wealth to help us. So this Underground Railroad was to blacks like Sojourner Truth that had knowledge and knew where to, could follow the North Star and pull people out. But yep. there was a lot of whites, if not all of the whites on this railroad, that yep. helped so it was. It was. It's always been black and white working together. It has to always been black and white. But at this point, it was the whites were providing the capital, right? In terms of the land, the the places, the the resources. But it was Harriet Tubman and black people who figured out how do we network this? How do we share this information? That was ah. what the white society didn't fully understand. So what do you do? I'll offer my barn. Who do I talk to? And how do I not get killed for doing this? You know, <laughs> okay. And it was the black people were like, oh, don't worry, we got that. We know how to communicate. We know how to network. We know how to do resource sharing, you know, and we know how to put information. We know how to encode information in such ways, you know, through all the Negro spirituals and all that. We know how to encode the information so that people won't know what it is we're actually sharing with each other. So that was that was huge. But then there was also more more, you know, regular old regular old mutual aid society. That they started either through through churches or secretly that slaves would share their money and they would fund one another's funerals or medical expenses. And they did it all in secret, like the one literate slave would keep a little, you know, a little book like hidden in their bed somewhere that would keep a record. Everyone. This one gave two pennies. That one gave two pennies. Oh, no. You know, now, you know, Mary's husband died. We've got to get a funeral because otherwise, you know, they wouldn't get funerals and they all you know, they take all the whole pot and put it in for that funeral. You know, and they had to do it all, you know, all in secret with secret ledgers. You know, and then when they got when they got uh, uh, free, the ones who did get free, they took those same principles and used them to survive. Because the real problem that that freed black slaves, free men had was they were not allowed to participate in the real economy. They couldn't get a bank loan. They couldn't start a normal business. They were cut off. In some ways, 
you know, the government cut them off from the economy as a way of making white poor people feel better about themselves. They could say, well, at least I'm not black, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm better than black. There was something that could be better than. Okay. Right. But I want to go back to this mutual aid society because my uncle in New York and my my mother was from New York, her family, and I would go visit them, and he would tell us about uh, rent parties, where in Harlem, in the in the multifamily, they would have if somebody lost their job or couldn't pay their rent, they would have a rent party, and they would sell food, and they would you know the the bank would take money from the gambling or you know, dancing or raffle, uh, you know raffles or whatever they had to make money, and then they would give that money to the one that could not pay rent. Okay, and then it would help them with the rent. So it was this community working together to support each other, which I just I found it fascinating when he would tell these stories in 1964, 65, 66 to us, and we would go mm-hmm. up to visit. And so this is the the mutual what what you're calling mutual aid, where yeah. people come together mutually and aiding each other. Okay, right, and it's not thought of as charity. It's not true no. because the other person's not another person. <laughs> this is, you know, it's back to your, you know, you were talking about Ubuntu, that, that as, a, as a life philosophy. When you're getting somebody else out of debt, when you're paying their rent, you're improving your community. If, if, and it's, it's, you know, economists still try to look at it as, as what they call reciprocal altruism, which is such a nasty way of saying it, right? Ew, that, oh, what is that? You're doing for me. Or I do for you so that later I know that you will do for me, as if it's like transactional. It's not transactional. It's communal. You are me. You are me. So when I, you know, uh, uh, like today, someone could take their money and invest it in the stock market, right? And they're putting money in some foreign corporation to go do something to someone else, God knows where, and maybe they'll make money on it. When you take your money and instead you invest it in your community, in a local business, you're investing in your friend. You're making your own main street better, right? And, and you make your main street better because that guy didn't have to go out of business. Now your tax base is higher. When your tax base is higher, your schools get better. When your schools are better, your kids get smarter and they can earn more money. So investing locally, helping other people out, it's, it's the same thing as feeding yourself if it's local, if it's closed. And that's the thing that happened by cutting off black people from the larger national economy. What they did was unwittingly forced black people into smaller circular economies of mutual aid. There was no one else to sell to, no one else to buy from, no one else to borrow from. So you ended up with a community circulating value in and amongst itself. And those communities got prosperous. They got wealthy. And that then created resentment. And that's why they got stormed. Just like my great grandparents were, were, you know, killed in a pogrom in Russia, white people who were jealous of black prosperity came storming in and killing people. And that's why we got Tulsa. Yeah. Greenwood. I think they said 20 towns. Yeah, but it kept happening, and they didn't understand why. They're like, wait a minute. We told them they can't own land. We told them they can't have businesses. We told them we're not going to give them any bank loans, that all they could do is work as our maids and work as our pullmen and work as our gardeners. And here they go ahead and build their own friggin' economy. And now they got Black Wall Street. Now they got nice clothes. (laughs) Now they got their churches better kept than our church. Well, let's go in and torch the place. Because they, they couldn't understand why, if black people are the, are the oppressed people, why are they doing better than us? Now I don't have anybody to look down to. I'm poor, I'm poor white. I don't have anything except for maybe a pig or two. And these blacks that I am better than are now better than me. They have better houses, better cars, better churches. Uh, we got to get rid of them. And we yeah. can go bomb them. Yeah. We can go... We can go torch their home, their churches. We can do that legally, or at least if they don't call it legally, but without any right. Any you don't have to pay for that. You yeah. don't go to jail. Yeah. So. No. Oh, it is a sad no. story, of America or Russia or anywhere yeah. else, where people are consistently put down, so the rich can be richer. Yeah. That's, and it's yeah, and it's not just you know we we in America because we watch Watchmen. We think Tulsa is like the one example. It's not. 
There, there was a ton of these. There's one in Durham called Haiti that was a, named after the first, you know, Black Republic. They they had the Mechanic and Farmers Bank and Insurance Company. I mean, this is all over America. These happen. <laughs> We're gonna take our second break. Douglas, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I can't thank you enough for being on today. We're going to come back and talk some more about this history and get into the future. What's happening now with COVID, with racism, with the economy, with climate change, which I call the four pandemics, and the worst one is stupidity, where people do not understand this history and do not understand how we come together with mutual aid societies and pull ourselves up as a community communities pull ourselves up. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. Mr. Douglas Rushkoff is our guest today, and he is just given a lot of information. He's really helping me to crystallize and understand this history and we're going to talk more about the about what's going on now in our world and the future but this program is brought to you by the national cooperative bank national cooperative bank's mission is to support and be an advocate for america's cooperatives and their members especially in low-income communities and in black and brown communities uh, most of them are low income or you have a lot of low-income folk we had, as an example, in Los Angeles, there's the Crenshaw Mall, the Baldwin Hill Crenshaw Mall. And in Crenshaw, the average median family income is $25,000. And even the U.S. says that 27 is 1000 a family of four is in poverty. So you got at least the average, and I would say perhaps 70% of the people in Crenshaw are in poverty in this Los Angeles, and they're trying to take this mall, 43 acres, and own it through this mutual aid uh, that uh, Mr. Rushkoff is talking about and help to create financial wealth, social wealth, political wealth. And it's taken politics, Douglas, to get this to where they can even buy it. It's going to take $115 million to buy it and another $900 million or so to develop it into the kinds of businesses that give this, you know, Douglas, in economy, I learned something about in white communities, money turns five times. They call it the multiplier, five to eight times. In black communities, particularly in urban, it would be one time. It would come in and go out, come in and go out. They would shop. They had to go away to do their shopping, whether it's grocery or whatever, not in the community. And what you're talking about, and I didn't understand that principle until I started talking about it here. What you're talking about is that when blacks only could depend on themselves before this integration came, which hurt us in a lot of ways, and this is one, then we had to have this, we go to down to the barber shop, the barber shop goes next door to buy his food, the guy that bought, bought the food goes to the cleaner in the neighborhood, gets his clothes clean, go to to wash his car in the neighborhood, that money turns five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and that's where the wealth gets created because that money is turning in the community, there's profit being created, and then they own this profit. I get that's what you're talking about. Is yeah, that, but right? that's yeah, but that's sacrilege to the current economic leaders. Right? Our economy since thirteen hundreds in Europe was based on growth, right? It's based on growth. The whole thing. They sh we used to have local currencies, and that that even in Western in Western Europe, they had local marketplaces that used these kinds of money. It was it was issued in the morning, and it expired by the end of the day. It was money like poker chips. The only thing money was there for was to help circulate trade through the community. I got chickens. You got shoes. She's got clothes. How do we circulate it? We're not going to trade it. We're going to use these little chips. In other words, just to keep track, like IOUs is the way it worked. And then it would get reconciled at the end of the day. But kings and queens, they were getting poor as the peasants were getting wealthy. So they made all that illegal, and they said, you got to borrow money from the central treasury at interest. you got to pay back more than you borrowed. And if that's true, then the economy has to keep growing in order to keep paying back money to the bank. So in America, it's also – it's about – Growth. That's what all the president even talks about. GDP. How do we grow the economy? Grow the economy. 
But what we're talking about now is, oh, no, no, no. It's not about how much money you can grow. It's about how fast can you circulate money. So in economic terms, we'd say we're not concerned about the growth of capital. We're concerned about the velocity of money. How fast can we get money moving through the system? It's like the difference between saying health. The health of an individual is how fast he can get. No, it turns out that's not true. <laughs> the health of an individual is how well the, the blood and, and, and fluids are circulating through the body. It's about motion. So the same thing in an economy. You could take one dollar. You could you could say to a business, "Do you want to earn ten dollars once, or do you want to earn one dollar ten times?" You're better off earning one dollar ten times because that means that 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 dollar circulated through the community and paid for this kid's teeth and that one's tutoring and that woman's uh, uh, you know ulcer treatment and then come back to your dry cleaner. It's all good. You know, and it's it's moving, and you watch it move, and everyone gets wealthy. And it's it's so simple. It's the difference between a living economy and a dead economy, an economy that we own or an economy that owns us, right? And too, it's too tempting to try to become rich in an economy where the economy owns you, and you're still a slave to it. You're still finally paying your, your interest on it. Um, rather than someone who's actually participating hands-on in a real living economy. And that's what we have to kind of retrain ourselves to understand. You're never going to earn enough money to insulate yourself from the horrors of the world. All you can do is earn money in a way that makes the world less horrible. Wow. How'd you get all of this, man? How'd you learn all of this? <laughs> reading people like W. But, but here's the here, here. You said reading the boys? Uh, yeah. The reason I ask you is because as I try to get this knowledge that I've learned through the National Association of Housing Co-ops, this older white gentleman, Roger Wilcox, another one, who is uh, Herbert Fisher, who's the lawyer in, in, Chicago, in Chicago, and he's in his 90s now. Unfortunately, Ro Roger died at 97 a couple years ago. So I learned this at their feet. I learned it at a guy. I started with a with several people, my father's friends and this Jewish man that owned a, a, a diamond store in a jewelry store in Bluefield, West Virginia. Uh, he would teach me things as I worked for him in the summers or in, around Christmas uh, about money and how money works and how money flows and all of those kinds of things. But you've captured all of this, and I have found it difficult to get this conversation with Barber, William Barber and the Poor People's Camp. I've been trying to reach him. And I started looking at the NAACP because the boys had started with one of the founders of NAACP, and he also was into his cooperation. And the reading I've done in Jessica's book with NAACP wasn't for this cooperation, and it don't seem to be today. I'm, I'm going to do some more research. Yeah. I've talked to Al Sharpton. I've uh, tried to um, – the Urban League, the, the president of Urban League was a gentleman – I'm losing his name – was a gentleman from New Orleans – uh, and he said that he didn't know anything, that the Urban League didn't do co-ops. And I fa later found out through Jessica Books that the Young Negro Cooperative League yeah. in the 30s and 40s, Ella Jo Baker had helped to start. They were meeting at the Urban League offices in New York. So there is this rich history that we seem to don't know about. And when we, I, I'm trying to get to these people to, to under, to, so they can understand this. See, I think it's better for America, better for poor people to own their own businesses in this cooperative movement than get this 15 bucks an hour. Now, it's hard for me to say yeah. that out loud because people think I'm crazy and I'm hell. So I say, let's do both. Okay, let's get the 15 bucks an hour well, and let's both. do this. Exactly. But, but the 15 bucks an hour is a dependency economy. Now, the, the problem is, the reason why we have such trouble selling this is, that even to social justice warriors, is they look at it, oh, you're giving us a model for poor people. You know, so you're saying we can't succeed in white America? You're saying we can never get that? It's like now that now they're going to close the gates to us? Now you, we're not going to get up that ladder? And we got to explain to them that ladder never existed. That ladder is about oppression. That ladder is about pollution. That ladder is about climate change. That ladder is about slavery. And, and if it's not slavery here, then you, then you just move the slavery over to China. But this, it doesn't actually work. It's hurting people. You know, and, and people have to understand that prosperity is a living thing. So it's a matter of us selling it, not as a way for poor people to get 
kind of a compromised sustainability, but rather this is a way to maximize wealth for everybody. Even if I'm going to be a wealthy person, I want to be a wealthy person with the stability of cooperativism and mutual ownership rather than a wealthy person sitting teetering on top of, a, of an unstable pyramid. That will likely crash, and therefore you're going to crash. So your whole system yeah. is in bad shape. Hmm. Or at least you're okay, going to so- go to hell, you know? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know you're not going to have a good time. You're going to be watching your back. You know, I don't want to watch my back. I don't want to. Uh, I want my kids to be able to go to school with my workers' kids, right? And I'm only going to be able to do that if my workers see me as the same as them, not as some dude on the top of a pyramid. Okay, so I want to say it a little bit differently and then see if I get what you're saying because I've, I've got to figure out how to sell this because I've, I've not been able to do it in 10 years or I've been trying to sell this to people. So you said ladder has never existed, this pyramid of of rugged individualism, I think you said it in your yeah. article, uh, the John Wayne, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstrap. I have it that that ladder has existed, but when you get to the top of that ladder, you're likely to fall off. And that ladder and that economy that you build, it, the structure of it is like, um, I don't know, lava. It, it, it can it can burn up and eat up the ladder, and you're going to fall into the lava of the this heat, maybe called hell. Okay, so I have it that the ladder exists, but it doesn't give you the stability and the safety that you want. It doesn't create the economy that you eventually want. In a in a better ladder for everybody is economy where everybody grows, everybody, and it's this mutual aid. Yeah. Is that what I you're mean, saying? The reason the, the- the, the moment I realized that the ladder really doesn't work was um, I got invited work. to do this talk for a um, bunch of uh, you know, like bankers and tech investors about the digital future economy. And I got there, and it was just five guys, five billionaires, and they wanted to know that they wanted help from me on how to plan their doomsday bunkers. Because they all believe that either climate change or economic unrest or a, a, a virus or something was going to be like this event, and they were going to have to go retreat. And they wanted to know things like, how do I maintain control of my security force after my money is worthless? Right? These guys are actively thinking. They're spending 10, 20 percent of their money on bunkers, on survival. They're preppers. They're billionaire on security. preppers. Right. So these guys are, are – are, it's so brittle. Their relationship, they are trying to earn enough money to insulate themselves from the damage they're creating by earning money in that way. And they know it. They are paranoid. They are unhappy. They don't let their kids use the products that they put on the market. You know, any of the people that you talk to who make iPads and make software and all that, they don't let their kids use it. They got to earn enough money to send their kids to private school where they're not exposed to what they're selling to everybody else. That's not even a happy, successful way to live, right? They're, they've imprisoned themselves in wealth, and that's just not – nothing Nothing good comes from that. So when, you're, when you are talking to them, what, what are the lessons you're telling them? What, what, did, what did you tell them? Well, it's funny. When I finally answered that – I mean, I get a bit like uh, Joan Rivers or Woody Allen. When I did, and I said, you know, if you want your head of security to take care of you after the apocalypse, maybe pay for that guy's daughter's bat mitzvah today. You know, it's a kind of a joke because the guy's probably not Jewish. But I was basically saying, be nice to people, and you won't have to deal with this friggin' scenario. Do your business differently, and you won't have to retreat from humanity in order to stay alive. Okay. So I. You know, we only have one more segment here. Is that right? Yeah, we only have one more segment. So I really want to come back and talk about, you talked about the survival of the riches and the, these people and what their fears are. But how do we change this economy? How do we come out of this COVID-19? How do we come out of a poor economy? How do we come out of the, the George Floyd being lynched and all of the lynching that happened mm-hmm. to your great-grandfather in his store or the lynchings that happened in New York with Rodney King or George Floyd or whomever throughout the South. And then we have this climate change issue that we are seeing all over, the fires in the West and the, and look at Texas now with all of the freezing. 
all the things that are going on. How do we how do we get come out of that? And that's what I really want to talk about in this last segment with you. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Information is power. So we're going to get some more information about how we come out of this COVID-19 and this economy that we have and in racism, which with Douglas Rushoff, who's our guest today. And what we've talked about so far is that history-wise, coming over as slaves throughout the Jim Crow, we were not, we couldn't get loans. We know that the Department of Agriculture would not loan black farmers um, money. They would loan whites and in some cases, they put in laws where the whites could get the land that the blacks had. And so we had 30 million acres of land in 1900, and we have 2.5 million acres of blacks today. So whites, when they would see us get better off and didn't understand how we were better off in Greenwood or Tulsa, then they got upset. They got angry, and then they would come and bomb us without having to go to jail. They come killers, they come lynchers. So if we were successful, they would do it. Or if we looked at their women in the wrong way, they would come out and kill us. So now, what do we do now? What do we learn from this circular economy, Douglas? How, what are the kinds of things that you think we ought to do in the whole society, not only blacks, but blacks, whites, Christian, Jews, Muslims, the old, rich, the poor, the, what do we do now to change this economy? Because I don't want to go back to the old. I'm not looking to go back to the old norm. I'm not at right. all interested in that. So how do, what do you suggest we do now to create the kind of economy that really supports each other, it supports everybody, all of the stakeholders win, okay, and, and, and grow, and therefore we have an economy where people are not scared that they're at the top, okay, and that if their ladder is going to get burned up or at the bottom and they can't even get a ladder, they can't even get to the first rung. Okay. Right. What do, we, what do you suggest we do? I mean, I think the first thing we do is, is get our, our heads out of the whole bailout mentality. Right. That, to think that, you know, Biden is going to write his one point nine trillion dollar check and give you fourteen hundred dollars. And then that somehow rescues you or gets you a job, you know, that we have to think about these things uh, uh, autonomously. I mean, I keep thinking about Malcolm X and, and, and the Panthers. It's like, no, no, there's no no handout, no thing. We got to do this ourselves somehow. And that, then the principles become really simple. You know, first, like we're talking about circular economics, keep your resources and revenue recirculating through the community and always accessible to the working class. So you don't invest in a Filipino, you know, mining company with some ticker symbol. You don't throw your money in freaking Bitcoin or something. You put, you 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 leverage the power of mutual aid to to lift up one member of the community at a time, each according to their need. You know, and that way you you maintain independence from the big employers. You don't look for a job at Walmart or uh, uh, look for money from disinterested investors at the banks, and instead you own businesses cooperatively with other workers. If your business is in trouble. You're scared. How am I going to pay my workers? You sit down with your workers and say, okay, we're in trouble. Know what I'm going to do? Everyone in this room is going to have a share of this company now. We are going to build this thing up together. You, do, it, they, you, you can use a, a variation on the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership Plan, to actually give your employees ownership of the company. That when, when your, your aging white boomer business owner wants to retire and sell the company to some private investors and get out, say, no, no, boss, sell it to us. We will run this company and convert the whole thing into a co-op. You know, with, with local businesses, and, and they're going under anyway, you know, so they're, 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 they need our investment. Rather than throwing your money in the stock market, which is risky, put your money in the barbershop, in the bookstore, in the, the business of the person that you own, that, that you know, own that business, and they're going to be responsible to you in a different way than they would be responsible to the, uh, uh, to the bank. Find your credit union. Find your cooperative bank. They have a fundamentally different structure. 
than a bank. You know, if you put your money in a credit union, you are investing in a, a bounded local business so uh, uh, or a network of, of local businesses. So there, there's ways to do it. It's just every time you make a business decision, you've got to think about, you know, who are the stakeholders in that decision? How do I keep this money local? How do I buy, you know, even if it costs a dollar more, buying locally will come back around uh, to help you form clubs of local businesses that that support one another you know it's not it's really it's not rocket science it's so much simpler than dressing your business up to get a loan from chase bank or something you know tur- turn to your community do local crowdfunding do create a local currency a local discount card that businesses can participate in do education hold town meetings where you explain to people in the community why it's better to be to be purchasing and investing locally and uh, and it works. It almost invariably works. You know, it's a matter of teaching kids the idea that wouldn't you rather have a great likelihood of being a hundred thousand air than a tiny possibility of becoming a billionaire? You know, you can just do it if you just want to have a sustainable business. That's so attainable. You know, whereas rather than than just playing the lottery, which is really how the big economy works. Wow. Okay. It seems too simple, man. And I've been teaching this, but when you when you break it down so clearly, it is so simple. Of yeah, it it was at one time buy from blacks, buy from blacks, but it's really yeah buy from the community. They've lied to us to think that the economy is something that comes from the Federal Reserve. The economy is some top-down thing. No. If you have needs and I have skills, we have the basis of an economy. If you know how to fix a refrigerator and I got a broken refrigerator and you got a kid who needs to know math and I know how to teach math, that's an economy. All we need is a means of exchange. And what they've done is they've monopolized that means of exchange. They've made money more expensive than it deserves to be. So if you want to start exchanging value with people, you can do that without their dollars. You can start keeping track of things different ways, start a a favor bank, a a let system, time dollars. There's so many other ways to do that before, you know, without even without even using their dollars. So I want to just really quickly, you mentioned credit unions, but there are four types of uh, Mm co-ops and it depends on who owns and controls the business. If the business is owned and controlled by the employees, then it's called a worker co-op. So you can think any business you can think about it, whether it's that hair salon we talked about, that beauty shop, the 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 store where you wash your cars, the the food the food co-op could be a worker co-op. And then uh, IBM could be a worker co-op. Ford Motor Company could be a worker co-op if the if the employees own and control it. And then if it's owned and controlled by the persons that uses the product or service, then it's a consumer co-op. The consumers mm-hmm. own housing co-ops. You mentioned credit unions. And then food co-ops could be owned by the consumer or it could be owned by the employees, the worker, or there I've seen some that are hybrid, 40% owned by right. the, 40% of the business owned by the, uh, the, co- um, by the uh, <laughs> employees and 60% by the uh, members. So then if if it's owned by – if a lot of times the businesses, particular farms, would come together and create a business that buys what they need, it's called a purchasing co-op. And this business that buys what they need get the skill sets, they will create the contracts, they, they get the mm-hmm. vendors, they can buy in volume, and therefore – and they know more about the seeds or the fertilizer, whatever they're buying, than a farmer right. would do, and they can get it at a lower price. It works. Artists are beginning to use this. There's a group in D.C. called Consumer Purchasing Alliance for nonprofits and schools and churches, and they've saved them a lot of money in doing this. Uh, a group of people then can come together or businesses and put their products that they make. They create a company, and it's called a marketing co-op, or sometimes it's called a producer co-op. Uh, farmers, uh, like uh, dairy farmers, 900, 9,000 of them, form Cabot Creamery or Lando Lakes or Ocean Spray, and they yep. bring their products to this market that market, this company can sell to markets that they could not sell to, or they can make from the milk, butter, or cheese, or cottage cheese, or whatever. They can produce more things to it. Okay, so 
there's a there is a Ujama in Pittsburgh where black women have gotten together and they they make jewelry and paint and everything make clothing and they have a storefront. These are the kinds of things that you're saying. Start these businesses, look for these businesses, and then buy in your neighborhood. It's in your neighborhood, whether it's a black business, a white business. It doesn't. If it's buy in your neighborhood and keep that money circulating in your neighborhood. We have have a minute left, sir. What would you like to leave people with? People will tell you two reasons why not to do it. One, they'll say it doesn't work, but we know it does work. Second, they're going to say it's bad for the economy. And in a certain sense, they're right. It's bad for the extractive Wall Street derivative economy. The economy that we live in now is based on how do we extract the most amount of money from people and places and store it in these stocks in these stock prices and in the derivatives on those stocks. That's what Walmart is about. Walmart comes into a town, the town becomes more poor. Even though the prices are low, the costs are higher because the, it's, it's like a vacuum cleaner, just sucking what value there is, what wealth there is out of the community. We have to understand that the short-term thinking of getting the lowest price on a piece of crap is is worse for us long term than learning how to actually provide and support, uh, provide for and support one another. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you very much, everybody out there. We really appreciate your listening to you. We'll see you next Thursday. Please live cooperative. Douglas, thank you very much for taking the time, buddy. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.